So today, I, I'm really excited to welcome Ron Becker here. Uh, Ron Becker is an international author, speaker, and consultant. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of computer science at the University of Toronto, uh, where he co-founded the Dynamic Graphics Project, which is really one of the, the, the oldest and, and one of the really influential uh, research labs in the, the space of human-computer interaction. Um, in addition to that, he founded the, the Knowledge Media and Design Institute and the Technologies for Aging Gracefully Lab. Uh, he received the, the Social Impact Award at, at ACM's CHI 2020 conference, was elected to the CHI Academy in 2005, and is an ACM Distinguished Speaker. Uh, he organizes uh, some different virtual communities around computers and society and has recently been, been writing a lot of books at kind of that intersection of computer society and computer ethics. Uh, and he's working on, on his next, next book, which is the Ethical Tech Startup Guide, based on what he's learned from founding five different software firms. And so today, his talk is really going to provide us a call to action to, to think a lot about uh, a lot of these different uh, topics. So uh, let's welcome Ron. OK, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks to the School of Information and Computer Sciences and Professor Jillian Hayes for um, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, the Social Impact Award that I got in 2020 um, was also gotten that year by Bonnie Nardi, who I believe is on your faculty. I can't actually see the list of all the participants right now, although I see Anne-Marie Piper and Stacey Granham, and, and that's all I can see, but I know there are more of you there. So what I'm gonna do today is review issues covered at greater length in my 2019 Oxford textbook, Computers and Society, Modern Perspectives, and especially in my recently self-published book, Digital Dreams Have Become Nightmares, What We Must Do, and also in the ethics column in the March issue of CACM. I'm trying to get my slides to advance and they're not advancing for some reason. Sorry, oh, there we go, okay. Information about my books may be found at the website that you see there. A little bit about me, a very little bit. I've been a researcher, teacher, entrepreneur, and digital media pioneer. It has been an exciting journey for 56 years. We explorers dreamed of a better world through technology, but our world is deeply troubled. We have accomplished much. We have Digital technologies are used for collaboration, learning, health, politics, and commerce. We have given humanity greater control over the universe. Augmented knowledge and creativity replace difficult and dangerous physical labor with robot work, improved our lifespan with computationally supported medicine, supported free speech with internet reason and dialogue, started work towards enabling greater road safety with the goal of denying individuals the right to kill on the highways and develop innovative, convenient, and sometimes safe products and services. We point with pride to digital heroes such as Sir Tim Berners-Lee, Doug Engelbart, Batya Friedman, Steve Jobs, Alan Kay, JCR Licklider, Lady Ada Lovelace, and Joe Weizenbaum. Yet there's much that is troubling we depend upon software that nobody truly understands and that is vulnerable to hackers and cyber terrorism. Privacy has been overrun by governments and surveillance capitalism. Totalitarian control is advancing way beyond that envisioned by the Panopticon in 1984. The internet floods us daily with news matching our prejudices with an increasing inability to tell true from false. Our children are addicted to their devices. Ubiquitous technology has made it easier to become workaholics. Jobs are being demolished without adequate social safety nets. A few digital leviathans threaten to control all commerce. Among the issues I'm most concerned about the hype associated with modern artificial intelligence and the risk to society stemming from premature use of AI. We are particularly vulnerable in domains such as medical diagnosis, criminal justice, seniors care, 
driving and warfare. In these areas, AI deployment has begun or is imminent, yet much of current AI is unreliable and inconsistent, without common sense, deceptive in hiding that it is an algorithm and not a person, mute and unable to explain decisions and actions, unfair and unjust, free from accountability and responsibility, and used but not trusted. And if you're interested more about these issues, I highly recommend Ben Schneiderman's recently published book on human-centered AI. It's quite excellent. Our digital dreams have become nightmares, matters of grave concern. Yet we are not helpless victims of forces outside our control. Although we cannot put the genie back into the bottle, it is not too late to ensure human control. My message is that there is much that we can and must do to make the digital world a better place. I shall st suggest steps of three kinds. Thoughtful and responsible citizens must avoid tech addiction, develop technological self-confidence, and speak out when tech threatens their lifestyle or values. Society typically acting via government must insist that computer scientists get a broader education academic programs and practitioners be accredited and licensed, and tech firms held to account via laws and active regulation. Finally, there are actions that we digital technology professionals can and must do, supporting citizens and legislators in the actions just mentioned, pursuing careers in public service, insisting on tech usability and responsive cu customer support, designing while keeping human values foremost, researching tough problems so that AI can be reliable and safe, and speaking out in the face of tech injustice or danger, even to the point of conscientious objection or whistleblowing. What is important about these actions by individuals, professionals, and governments is that they be done by representatives of the three sectors working together. I am optimistic that such synergistic actions can result in a more humane digital world and one that is more consistent with our values. Let's now look at the required actions in more detail. I will start with actions for ordinary people. By this, I mean non-technical people who nonetheless encounter technology daily. This includes our parents and grandparents and neighbors and friends. We can influence their behavior. They're keen to share their concerns and frustrations with tech and to listen, listen to our ideas and advice. Everyone must exercise self-control over their use of digital media and technologies. We can limit the use of our cell phones. We can establish periods of disconnection for minutes, hours, or even days at a time. We can establish zones in our personal space where we're unavailable, as for example, at dinner time with family or when out with friends. When is the last time that you rode on transit? I'm assuming you actually have transit down in Irvine. When is the last time that you rode on transit and instead of texting or playing a video game, you looked around, observed your fellow humans, noticed something pleasing or bizarre, and maybe even smiled or waved. Social psychologist Jean M. Twenge has analyzed data on 1.1 million 8th, 10th, and 12th graders using national representative US surveys taken between 1991 and 2016. Psychological well being that is self-esteem, life satisfaction, and happiness started decreasing suddenly after 2012. Adolescents who spent more time on activities such as social media, texting, and gaming, and less time on activities such as social interaction, sports, and exercise had lower psychological well-being. Those who spent more than 10 hours a week on social media were 56% more likely to feel unhappy compared with adolescents who spent less time on social media. 
depressive symptoms and suicide rates increased between 10, 2010 and 2015. Those spending more time on social media and smartphones were more likely to report mental health issues. Eighth graders who use social media heavily increase their risk of depression by 27%. It is highly likely that the pandemic has made all of this worse. Parents must establish and enforce rules for limited digital immersion by their children, much as there have long been bounds on TV viewing. There should be limits on time spent accessing the internet and on the use of social media. Parents can explain their motivations behind their putting limits on digital junk food. A serious problem is that many people, our uncles and aunts and neighbors and acquaintances feel inadequate with respect to technology. They feel that they don't understand it, they can't do it, and that it's their fault because they are stupid. They are not stupid. They should not feel inferior. Despite the dedicated work of user experience design professionals, functionality and complexity in software and bureaucratic systems continue to grow faster than simplicity. So users continue to be overwhelmed and feel inadequate. Yet there are very few digital tech concepts that cannot be explained to ordinary people. People should not put up with jargon, with geek speak. If techies use the word backdrop or complexity or concurrency or infrastructure or microcode or phishing or platform or prom or even the word system, they must be asked to put it in plain English. Tell your parents and neighbors to expect to have technology ideas and concepts explained clearly to them. Cyberbullying, cyber terrorism, deep learning, GoFi, identity theft, intelligent tutor, machine learning, net neutrality, precision mes medicine, user experience, all can be explained sufficiently in a few minutes to enable citizens to feel less steamrolled by tech. Underlying many applications and uses of digital technology are social and ethical questions about their use, about a community's priorities, and about fairness, justice, and goodness in a society. Answers to these questions underlie society's actions with respect to tech and tech companies and the applicable regulations and laws. Ordinary citizens can indicate their approval or disapproval of the actions and ethics of tech companies by their purchasing power. If you disagree with how a firm behaves, do not buy their products, do not download their apps, commit virtual identity suicide, tell the company what you did and why you did it. Ordinary citizens can and must be included in critical decisions about technology and how it will be introduced and used. They must be full participants in social, political, and ethical discussions about tech. They must make their voices heard. They must engage in political action. Citizens can lobby and ultimately vote expressing support or indicating disapproval of actions involving digital technologies, such as making your city streets available for testing self-driving cars, or if it should become a so-called smart city. Both examples are real cases, the latter where I live in Toronto, Canada. Citizens should speak up with letters to their elected representatives and on social media. Finally, people who have invested in a company can make their voices heard as shareholders, as Amazon has experienced with respect to climate change. If you feel strongly enough, buy a few shares of the company you feel is evil and speak up at the shareholders meeting. Other actions must be taken by society, typically by their governments. Before the 60s, universities were committed to the concept of a liberal education. This was thrown out by many colleges in the turmoil of the Vietnam War. Hence, the education of many CS students today contributes little to their understanding of the world in which they will work and of their responsibilities as citizens of the world. This must change. CS students must not focus totally on computing and math 
as in currently often the case in many leading computer science departments, I believe not at Irvine. Students should learn about virtue ethics and utilitarianism, the agony of Lear and the confusion of Kay, and the yearnings of the politically dispossessed. Most universities receive significant funds for government so society can apply pressure on schools so that they do the right thing. CS students should also be CS students should also be required to do some work in the area called computers and society or computer ethics. Such courses are typically not required by major research universities, which is a mistake, but are often required by liberal arts colleges. My recent books thoroughly cover subjects for such a course. An alternate and imaginative approach, but one that is rarely used, is to introduce key issues by reading and viewing science fiction novels or films. Students find the material engaging and an effective vehicle for discussing ethical issues raised by computers, robots, and AI. Recently, under the leadership of CS Professor Barbara Gross, in collaboration with philosophy professor Allison Simmons, Harvard has developed an exciting alternative, embedded ethics. They embed philosophers directly into all CS courses that teach students how to think through ethical and social implications. Students study data bias in a machine learning course, fake news in a networks course, and accessible interfaces in an HCI course. Material is presented by a philosophy teaching fellow or grad student. Results have been very positive. Students are engaged with many expressing eagerness for more exposure to ethics content and more opportunities to develop skills in ethical reasoning and communication. The program keeps ethics at the forefront throughout the curriculum. Harvard is on track towards introducing an ethics component into every one of their undergraduate courses. And I know a number of leading universities are considering uh, adopting the program. Society also needs to take a stand with respect to licensing and accreditation. Medicine, law, and engineering have long licensed practitioners and accredited their qualifications in those of degree programs. Physicians, lawyers, and engineers may be held legally responsible for their actions. Actions running counter ethical norms are subject to sanctions, removal of qualifications to practice, and even prosecution. Computer science has heretofore not been subject to such standards. There's been no mechanism to ensure acceptable performance. This must change. I believe it will change. There are two aspects of this. First, university and college computer science departments must agree to being accredited. And the accreditation requirements specifying aspects of a general education must be strengthened. The current ABET accreditation only requires half of a single semester on computers and society with no requirement for study of ethics. This is wrong. Second, computer scientists must be licensed with requirements for continuing education, adherence to standards of professional practice and procedures for license removal and even fines in prisons, prison for gross malpractice in the profession. And as you see on this slide, digital technologists will soon face legal and financial consequences if their work causes harm. Digital technologies have long been regulated by laws dealing with privacy, yet regulation in most of the world has been slow and legal action has been relatively rare. This is changing because of concerns about social media hate speech and disinformation and evidence that tech firms have allowed persistent invasions of data privacy. Europe has been at the vanguard of such legislation as with the general data protection regulation. It has also been working on tougher privacy safeguards and has vigorously enforced 
laws against big tech. In the US, there is ongoing discussion, but still no action to change the so-called safe harbor section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which grants immunity to internet firms for the consequences of harm, harmful speech. Amazon and Facebook have brought much good into the world, but these two tech giants must be broken up on antitrust grounds to prevent the further growth of monopoly power. Facebook has demonstrated repeatedly that it is unwilling and unable to control the dissemination of hate speech and disinformation on its platform. Its extreme metaverse focus now further proves that it does not accept responsibility for the safety of its users. Amazon's goal is to be the supplier of all commercial goods, not only books and electronics, not only groceries and pharmaceuticals, but everything humans buy. Its smarts, cash, and vertical integration give it the power to do so. Finally, I shall discuss how digital technology professionals can work towards tech becoming a more uniformly positive force for society. I address this to all computer scientists, engineers, humanists, social scientists, and designers who work in tech. I have insisted that ordinary people not be intimidated by technology and that they not accept geek speak. Hence, you must do your part. Start by practicing your ability to describe in plain English tech work you are doing or what you read about in the media to your parents, relatives, and friends. Also tell everyone about gethuman.com, a website which discloses the phone numbers of customer support departments of many firms, including many tech firms, that do not advertise the numbers, but actually have a support department with personnel eager to help. If you work for a tech firm, insist on a commitment to responsive government customer support and not just a set of FAQs. Digital technologies are pervasive. Students specifying in tech, specializing in tech, should consider government careers or even running for public office. Occasionally we see legislators or governors who were doctors or teachers or business people. Wouldn't it be amazing if computer people also assumed these offices and could bring their expertise to inform and enrich public tech policy? It would be even more amazing if these individuals also had backgrounds and sensitivity to sociology, law, and ethics. A good example is my ex-student, Sean Chen, whose degree at University of Toronto was in computer science and equity studies and did, later did a master's in education and who currently is a member of the Canadian parliament. Recent US congressional hearings on Facebook have shown how little many politicians understand about technology. There are no doubt career op opportunities for ethical technologists in agencies such as the US Congressional Research Service and in the research arm of the Canadian Lib Library of Parliament, which have the mission of making legislators more knowledgeable. This audience, of course, knows the need for sensible, thoughtful technology design. Yet there's design stupidity constantly throughout the world. Here's a recent example that I encountered in San Francisco in the BART transit system. The ticket kiosk on the left has a slot seemingly, seemingly for inserting a clipper e-ticket to add funds. The station gate on the right has a slot seemingly for inserting a clipper to gain entrance. Yet in both these cases, the slots do nothing except gobble up e-tickets. In one case, they had to open up the machine to give me back my ticket. The correct position procedure is to tuck, touch the clippers to a scanner. On the left, the scanner touch point is there, but it's surrounded with visual clutter. On the right, it is not easy to see from the front. Surely we can do better. 
know the word bloatware, systems cluttered with needless duplicate information or with thousands of commands and features, most only appealing to a tiny minority of users. Apps are packed with more features than any normal human needs and use. A study 20 years ago by my then PhD student and now UBC professor Joanna McGrenery and Dr. Gail Moore showed that most users of Microsoft Word employ only 50 of the thousands of commands and options included with the software. Bloatware makes systems unreliable and forbidding, so campaign vig vig vociferously against it. Speak up when you encounter systems that are not usable, that are cluttered and confusing, that seem inadequately tested, and that leave people unhappy and frustrated. Complain to your coworkers if you are working for a firm behind such monsters of poor design and careless implementation. Then complain vociferously to managers and executives of the firm. Another action is to consider a firm's ethical track record in deciding whether to work there. New computer science graduates sometimes do this. Facebook saw this after the Cambridge Analytica scandal and other misuses of social media during the 2016 election, which caused many new grads to shun the company. One wonders how Facebook recruiting has fared in the past few months after the revelations by whistleblower Francis Haugen. An example of technology motivated by so social good is value sensitive design developed by University of Washington, Professor Batya Friedman and her collaborators. Digital technologists who play key design roles can conceive of ways to ensure that the system's functionality and user interface reflect the values they hold dear and those of good people everywhere. Values such as transparency, clarity, openness, fairness, compassion, empathy, honesty, justice, safety, self-determination, and simplicity. There are many other ways in which professionals can act for social good. They can look for applications of computers that address pressing societal problems, such as, the, such as the environment. They can look for aspects of digital technology that speak to pressing user needs, such as clarity and ease of the created user experience or availability and sensitivity and humanity in customer support. They can join the increasing number of development teams working on ethical AI. Computer scientists can help ensure that algorithms which act as AI agents on behalf of people are identified as algorithms rather than people. Decisions and actions of algorithms must be explainable. The explain explanations must be understandable by humans. There are opportunities to work on ensuring that algorithms make decisions that are fair and just as opposed to those that are biased and unjust. There is now active research on explainable AI and fair algorithms, both very interesting, difficult, and critical problems, although the need for algorithmic self-identification is not widely acknowledged. Employees can speak up when they believe their firm's actions are immoral or evil. There are ways to escalate speech that are reasonably safe. Start with private conversations with fellow employees or managers. Ascertain whether others feel the same way. Next, email these same people. Then engage individuals in private collective actions, statements of your belief to managers. Finally, if none of this works and you are still concerned or morally outraged, go public with your complaints at first just within the firm, and finally in such a way that your beliefs become known outside of the firm. Google represents an interesting case study. Many employees spoke up when the firm was participating in a military project viewed as odious, when it was working for US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, while that agency seemed immoral. When Google planned to develop a search engine for China, 
that would enforce censorship and when the firm's actions with respect to gender equality and safety were viewed as insufficient. Turmoil within the company with an original slogan, don't be evil continues today. The situation seems to be worsening as people have been fired apparently in retaliation for speaking out against company actions or even for publishing papers. There also seem to be hires of individuals skilled at opposing unions as unions have now been formed both at Google and very, very recently at Amazon. There are also two far stronger kinds of employee actions. One action that takes huge belief is to become a conscientious objector. Pattern on the concept of soldiers or civilians refusing to serve in any war or in a specific war, conscientious objection is the refusal to work for that company or in a particular project of a company. The distinction between general and selective objection is important. My friend, Louis Font, who in 1969 became the first West Point graduate on active duty in the army to become a selective conscientious objector and refused to serve in the Vietnam War, did so even though he was not objecting to all war. So one can object to a specific task or to all work at a company. A recent big tech example is the departure of four Facebook independent directors in one year, including the former CEO of American Express, who resigned in protest over the firm's governments and political policies. The final action is whistleblowing. Whistleblowing occurs when an employee is so convinced of the immorality of confidential actions by a firm that he or she announces to the world what the firm is doing. Well-known recent examples of whistleblowing in tech are Edward Snowden with revelations about surveillance by the National Security Agency and Francis Haugen about Facebook. The US government has protections forbidding retaliations against employees who engage in whistleblowing, although Donald Trump tried to weaken them. There are no such policies in private firms so conscientious objection and whistleblowing, whistleblowers speak up at grave personal risk. To sum up, there's much we can do. We can work with parents and neighbors to insist that they can understand enough about high tech to exercise their rights as citizens with respect to how it is used. We can opt for careers in government service. We can try to ensure that the education of computer scientists and governance of computer science reflects our values and beliefs. We can pursue careers recalling our values, speak up when a company's actions are not consistent with these values, and direct our industry participation in ways that advance the public good. This talk and my recent writing is intended to be a clarion call call to action, a call to leave space in our lives for literature and history, a call to refuse to engage in jargon and geek, geek speak, a call to overcome lethargy and defeatism, a call to think hard and feel deeply about what we believe, a call to reflect on what is truth and what is justice, a call to step forward and act. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your comments and questions. Please feel free to write me at the email address, visit my back book website, and join our new virtual community of people about the issues I have discussed. We are seeking other student volunteers to help our new nonprofit for the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We we have a, a good amount of time for questions. Feel free to either uh, raise your hand or put them in chat. Anne Marie, do you want to go ahead first? Thank you, Ron, for that very interesting um, uh, talk that gives us so many different things to think about, so many different dimensions there. And the thing I was kind of grappling with as you were talking is that so much of this is 
an ideal position and an idealized agenda that I think a lot of us can agree with in theory. But when it comes down to it, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, this being, it's a privileged position to be able to turn down services, to be able to say no to a job, right? Um, and I just think that what you're asking us to do, to speak out, you even mentioned sort of the risks around that, but I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the messiness of that, especially as we come, confront issues of equity, um, issues of gaslighting, things like that. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's certainly easy and I hope it doesn't seem glib for me sitting here as a professor emeritus uh, to make suggestions like this. Um, and in the extreme case, this is done with uh, career, um, you know, with, with dangers to one career. The woman, I think I mentioned her pronounced name, Timnit Gayru, uh, who, um, well, she didn't leave Google on her own accord, but, uh, you know, she was speaking out, she was being very assertive in terms of her ethics and her values, and she lost her position. So I don't mean to minimize the, the risks. Uh, on the other hand, there are ways, I believe, that one can start more gently without taking it to that point. Speaking up to fellow co-workers, uh, having informal chats with your managers over a beer uh, there, and things like that, that enable you to, first of all, uh, help um, understand your moral and ethical position. Is this really something you feel strongly about? Do you really feel evil is being done? And see if with small steps, you can start to make a difference. It may be that your manager is in fact open to some of these thoughts and that your manager then will have a chat with his or her manager. And so, uh, so I, I believe that, that one can start to act in this way. Let me make another point. Let's say you work in AI. Um, I, I think, and I haven't been on the career market, but, but I am very heartened by the number of research institutes and initiatives that are being formed now at major universities and even within some of the tech companies to deal with issues like explainable AI and bias in AI. So if you're an AI wizard and you feel strongly that these are uh, issues that you care about and that you want to influence your career choices, you may be able to look for a position in in that area. And the third comment I'll make is, uh, goes back to some of my comments about citizen self-confidence about technology. This is something we can all do. We can help ensure that the people I call ordinary people, parents, neighbors, non-technical friends, don't feel so inadequate about technology. So there are, so they are willing to speak up if they feel that something's wrong with the way tech is manifesting itself in the world. But you're absolutely right. These are, uh, in many cases, these involve very, very difficult steps. I mean, and, you know, I'll, I'll take my friend Louis Font as an example. I mean, he, he, uh, he worked for six months developing his conscientious objective claim, then submitted, submitted it to the army, was was doing graduate work at Harvard before he was supposed to go to Vietnam, was um, someone, a soldier in uniform, came to his class a few weeks later, said, Lieutenant Font, come out of class. He was ordered to Fort Meade. He was very resourceful. So when he was at Fort Meade waiting for the army to try to duel with him, he investigated poor housing con con conditions at Fort Meade. Fort Meade. He, he called press conference with Congressman Ron Dellums, who was a fiery black congressman from uh, Oakland. Uh, most of you are too young to remember Ron Dellums. Um, and so eventually the army was so sick of him that he let it, he, he, they let him out with an honorable discharge. And he's devoted his life to serving 
soldiers in the military who have problems with the military in part because uh, they've objected to actions of the military. So that's just one example. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, please? Stacy. Hi, this is Stacy Branham. Thank you, I think, for your talk. <laughs> it, it's, it's quite a lot, isn't it? Um, and so my question is, is in a similar vein as Anne Marie's and inspired by uh, your recommendation, we leverage fiction to think about the implications. Have you seen The Good Life, the TV show, The Good Life, maybe some folks in the audience, or The Good Place? Uh, th this is a show that is a farcical ex exploration of how we navigate this intractable set of like ethical quandaries that we find ourselves in in life and what is a truly moral decision and the, the right uh correct way to go right um and so i just wanted to give an example from my recent experiences adobe uh is the the company that helps us produce pdfs which there are billions of in the world right now and i would estimate the vast majority of those are inaccessible to people who use screen readers and so I pay actively for subscriptions to help my students produce more accessible PDFs uh, and for subscriptions to Adobe Pro. And I tried to cancel one the other day and they had the most incredible dark pattern and made it, I had to basically essentially beg them to stop charging my card so I could cancel my subscription. I'm not particularly happy with this company. But what am I to do? Am I to walk away and stop paying for Adobe so that I can make PDFs accessible to my blind students to like, you know, pay with my wallet or vote with my wallet? Um, and then another, I'll just add one more uh, layer of complexity to this. I manage accessibility for SIGCHI and the new process we have to generate PDFs for our publications generates completely inaccessible PDFs. And, uh, and I'm faced with the decision of whether I should pay the company that produced an inaccessible process to remediate the PDFs, which is what we're currently doing. So I, I just wanted to say it's even if I have the privilege and the capability to, um, to advocate for what's right, how do I know what is right? It's so complicated. And this is just one little decision in my very, very complicated life. <laughs> uh, well, for, first of all, um, there are clearly ethical dilemmas that um, are very troubling. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm suggesting that, that computer science and digital technology um, students have some introduction to ethics is to start giving them some of the background to start to think about these things. But, I don't think the example you give is, um, is is terribly difficult. Finding a solution might be difficult, but and and this came up actually in my life just uh, earlier this week. Uh, I'm the founding editor, and in fact, Jillian Hayes is now one of the editors of what's now a Springer Nature uh, uh, series entitled. Um, lectures on technology and health. And we're about to publish a 50 year in perspective of uh, the Trace Center, which used to be at the University of Wisconsin, um, uh, founded by Greg Vanderheiden, now at the University of Maryland run by Jonathan Lazar. And it turned out Springer uh, didn't have a process or a commitment to making their publications accessible, even though Morgan and Claypool, which is who created the series that I was the editor, had made such a commitment to me. Uh, when Jonathan Lozar actually called it to our attention, Springer agreed that they would honor the commitment. And so um, um, it may well be that if you uh, don't take no for an answer and try to get, start with, for example, Adobe people who work in HCI, there must be some, uh, you can make enough noise to get Adobe to change the policy. And although um, it's probably 
unfair of me to say, right, Jonathan, um, I'll do it anyway, because Jonathan Lazar is not only an expert in accessibility, but he also went back and got a law degree. And so this might be something that, that uh, he might be interested in. And maybe I'll write him after this and say, hey, is he willing to talk to you about this? So there's no guarantee that you can do something, but you might be able to do something. And so, and it's your privileged position as a prof at a major university that also gives you some of the leverage to do it. Thank you. Two great questions. How about some other questions? I see 17 people are here. Go ahead, Miriam. Mm, thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Baker. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk and I'm very new to this field and I have little experience with ethical issues, but I've read a little bit about it in regards to data collection from users, which has been unethically done through US government. So as a student or as a new researcher, I can say, what steps do you suggest for me to take on my end since I don't have any authority authority figure or I don't know capabilities so what smaller steps I can take which can lead into something bigger in a collective manner well I I'm, I find it hard to recommend sort of a, a clear path because it's hard to tell what issues you would ultimately find troublesome all I can say is that uh, a good way to start is to start talking with fellow students about what do they think about how modern technology, big tech, high tech is being used and are there issues that concern them and see if in such discussions, uh, there are issues that, that really concern you. And then um, depending on the issue, I would recommend different steps so it's hard for me to recommend it in general but but certainly whatever reading you can do and whatever discussing you can do uh, that's one of the reasons that i want computer science students to have a broader education um, computers and society as a course has been taught at the university of toronto for um, i believe about 50 years let's see uh, that would take it back to 72, which is the year I arrived at Toronto. Maybe not in 72, maybe the first class was ta taught by the founding um, uh, professor in the department, Professor Tori Gottlieb. Uh, he co-authored the first, what I believe is the first book on the subject, which he published in 1973. Even at the University of Toronto, with Kelly Gottlieb having enormous prestige and re respect, and moral force leverage within the department, he was unwilling to ever say the department should require it for our students. It's now under Professor Ishtiak Ahmed, it's become a very, very popular elective. And so hundreds of students are taking it each year. But uh, so, the, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to, to, um, to get this field to start to think about its moral and ethical responsibilities in a way like uh, physics had to come to come to grips with its responsibilities after the atomic and hydrogen bombs were formed. We don't have anything that's as dramatic and as cataclysmic right now in terms of the loss of life, but but the effect on our society, I believe, is every bit as great, and the impact of my writing and speaking now is to try to get people to read more and to think more and to talk more. So that's my primary recommendation to you. Thank you. So while we're waiting for other questions from our, our students and our alumni, uh, one thing I was wondering um, was from our from our place in the in a department of informatics in a school of information and computer science, 
Um, I was kind of curious. Uh, your a lot of a lot of your discussion is kind of. Uh, centering around computer science practitioners and researchers, which I think I think makes a lot of sense, especially kind of given the history of the field. Um, but those of us in, in informatics and who have a long history of, of doing work in this space um, have, have often kind of maybe, I, I, I don't know exactly what the word to use, but we've been thinking a lot about the, the sort of problems that you're, you're bringing up for a while. And so I guess my question is, um, what can we be doing as informatics researchers, scholars, practitioners to make our, our work, our thoughts more uh, interpretable, more understandable to the, the computer science practitioners? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and there's no question that um, informatics schools, high schools, have in general done a far better job in uh, certainly um, acquainting its students with issues of um, of user interface and user experience. Have certainly done a better, far better job in uh, in introducing concepts such as stakeholders, because that appears very strongly in in work and computer security collaborative work, which has been very strong, and certainly in, 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 in your department with um, Judy and Gary Olson. Um, and so um, I guess my recommendation would be, I'm sure many of you have friends who are in, let's say, uh, computer science departments that are for, that are more narrowly focused that don't bring these issues in. Uh, and certainly um, talking and allying yourself with people in these departments um, is, is something valuable. I do have a question. Uh, I, you know, I know enough about your school and your program to know that things like usability, user experience, stakeholders, CHSW is all very strong. How about, how about issues of ethics? Is that brought up in any of your courses as well? Uh, so, so others could, could speak up as well, but at, at both the undergraduate and the graduate level, we, have, uh, we actually have a couple of different course sequences on uh, technology and society. Uh, certainly going back to uh, you know, some, of the, some of the folks like, uh, like Paul Dorish and Jeff Bowker and, and other folks who have been here for a while and have really been kind of perpetuating that. So that's really been a, a core part of our curriculum, certainly. Yeah, so I'm sure, you know, I, in a sense, my remarks are directed beyond your department and towards individual action by those of you in the department who have already been sensitized to some of those issues? Because, as I say, I think I think uh, high schools, I think in, in general, are, have have done great things. And and when I when I give career advice to people in HCI who have a broad focus and not just HCI in a very narrow sense, like how much faster is this interaction technique than uh, another interaction technique. Uh, I'm actually, I don't give this advice very often because I don't get asked, but I'm encouraging broad people in the field of HCI to look at iSchools increasingly as places where they will find uh, uh, the kinds of values that I think uh, uh, all of computer science should have. And that's not to imply that all computer scientists have no values. As, as I say, I've been very heartened by the number of AI people who have been uh, in some sense shocked by how how biased their algorithms were uh, and are working on that and the number of people who are working on uh, on um, AI explainability uh, in this case not so much that they're shocked that they're as upset as I am about how exp unexplainable AI is but because they're finding it a very, very interesting technical problem, which it certainly is. Uh, do we have any, any last questions for Ron from the audience? I'm, uh, 
um, I'm prepared to stay on longer, so I'm happy to take other questions. I'm looking in the chat. I don't think I don't see any questions in the chat. If someone wants to put a question in the chat, I'm willing to answer it that way too. Uh, Stacy raised her hand again. Okay. I do. Yeah, I'm wondering, Ron, can you just share with us the um, your your favorite individual action that you've taken to fight back? <laughs> My favorite individual action that I've taken, well, uh, with respect to tech, um, mainly I write books and I give lectures. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, what, what have I done? Um, I'm constantly threatening to 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 leave Amazon, uh, but but I must say I have I must admit I have not stopped buying books from Amazon yet, and Amazon Prime is such a bargain that that um, I do have an Amazon Prime, and once in a while I try to avoid it. I even go to Whole Foods because they have such great bread. So. Um, uh, Thank know, you I'm, for your confession. <laughs> you make I, me I, feel more human. <laughs> am I being hypocritical? I use Facebook as little as possible, but I haven't, I haven't quit Facebook totally because I, I, I can't find pub, I can't find a publisher for most of my new books, and so I'm self-published, and I have to build a brand and tweet and post in order to build my brand which is going relatively slowly. I'll be about 200 years old before I have built my brand. Uh, so, uh, but I'm actually enjoying it. Uh, I'm actually enjoying the exercise of tweeting and posting. At first I thought, I said, I can't possibly tweet. That's just, that's just uh, uh, sound bites. I can't think in sound bites, but it's actually an interesting intellectual challenge, which is if you, have something to say about, say, computers and society, or about ethical entrepreneurship, which are the two things I, I tweet about, and then I put them in LinkedIn and, and, and Facebook. It's an interesting exercise to try to put it out in 200 bytes, 280 bytes. And so it's actually proved to be fun. So it's something you might all consider as well, to try to enhance the quality of dialogue about all of this. So I will, if I think of Thank anything, you. if I think of anything else that I've done, uh, I'll, let, I'll let you know, but uh, mainly, mainly I'm writing and speaking, so, and tweeting. All right. Well, thank you, Ron, for, for coming in and joining us and, and for sharing this call. It's certainly given us a, a lot to think about. Uh, I'm going to paste Ron's email in the, the chat one more time for, for those of you who have follow on. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to, I'm certainly happy to engage in email. So good. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Have a Thank great weekend, so everyone. Bye-bye.